There you are now, welcome back to the workshop. So today's episode is going to be a machining video. We're up in the machine shed with the Colchester. So um, I took the drums off the Landy uh, there a while ago and we were waiting on parts to come. And while we were waiting for parts to come, I said I might as well trew the drums up in the lathe. Uh, and it's a nice job for the Colchester, which is our biggest lathe that we have. It's a good job for that in the four jaw chuck. So I said I'd bring you along with me for the experience. So I'll talk a little bit about the Colchester, I suppose, because I know there's been a good few questions about this baby and um, I want to give you as much information as I can on it. So this Colchester is reasonably new to the shop. I rescued it back in 2000 and I think the, the Christmas time of 2018 heading into 2019. It was belonging to a lovely guy out in Kildare who had it in his workshop for a number of years. I don't actually know how long. Unfortunately, he passed away um, and the house and property was being sold off. And another close friend of mine um, alerted me to the fact that this laid was going a begging. And in fact, a few people had come and looked at it and said it wasn't worth salvaging. And the only thing it would be worth is its scrap value. Thankfully, the guy thought about me, gave me a call, and I went out and looked at it, immediately fell in love, and hatched a plan to bring it home. Uh, speaking of that, if you go over to our uh, coffee um, website, it, there's a link to it in our description. I put up a blog post about actually rescuing this laid, myself and my father, and the whole experience of going to do it. So there's a blog post over there, which we'll also link in the bottom of the description here. You can go over there and have a read about it and find how the laid got to here. There's some interesting photographs of the laid up on my car trailer and stuff like that. So the laid has been in the shop here for uh, about two years and I've been tipping away at it. Um, you guys might remember it or some of you might remember it from when we did the line boring um, uh, series on the A-series engine block. And we used this lathe to do that job. I've been kind of tipping away, modifying it and trying to make it work. Unfortunately, and I don't think it was the previous owner, I think it was the owner before that, took the apron off the cross slide. So taking the apron off the cross slide, the apron used to sit across the bottom here and it would have had all the major carriage functions. It would have had a pinion gear to run the uh, cross slide up and down the bed of the lathe. It would have had a half nut to engage with this gear here, uh, sorry, with this um, uh, screw tread here to cut screw treads and it also would have had a drive key that would have engaged with this shaft. Uh, to run the carriage back and forward for various different turning operations. Unfortunately, the savagery was still not finished after they took that off. They cut through the drives here. This one is still cut with an angle grinder just to get them out of the way and pull the bed off. We think they were trying to um, use the lathe for a, a wood turning lathe or something like that. I then, when I got it, obviously had no cross slide uh, function, which was really, really detrimental to this lathe and pretty much rendered it useless for all but one or two um, functions. So I got to work and I bought some aluminium stock off of eBay and I made up this sort of T-nut situation you see here. I actually had to cut this tread myself on my XL Junior lathe. Uh, it was back before I was making videos. I would have brought you along for it in those days, but it was before I made videos. So it's actually a half nut situation. That's one block of aluminium there. There's one block here. Sorry, Billy's trying to get you a better angle. So we have a block here, which is mounted to the cross slide. We then have another block here, which is half the tread of this nut. And this is um, Acme five treads per inch. That's what this is, this lead screw is Acme five treads per inch. Now, cutting Acme five treads per inch is near enough impossible in, in modern equipment because it's a kind of a dead screw tread. Uh, and my own smaller XL lathe couldn't cut five treads per inch. So I actually had to build a small gearbox for my XL lathe so I could actually cut this uh, Acme tread that's running through this nut. Anyway. The heel of the hunt, I eventually got it all to work and I have this Acme tread connected up here and it's connected to the cross slide. I then remade this shaft here where it joins into the original gearbox 
and the original gear kit is running it here. So this is the change gears for tread, uh, screw tread cutting. Unfortunately, they had also decimated the drive end back here. They'd taken all the gears, all the change gears were taken and thrown away. All the drive shaft and the clutch system was taken away. Um, so I've kind of fabric cobbled together a motor and pulley situation over here at the side. We have a kind of a motor and pulley situation here, which is driving the original laid gearbox. And then that drives the main head. What I have then done here is I bought off of um, eBay um, one of these power feeds for a milling machine and I've coupled that into the screw tread cutting box here on the lathe. Now it doesn't allow me to cut treads, it just allows me to power feed the carriage off the lead screw. For 90% of what I do, that's fine. Any screw cutting that I need to do, I can do on my XL lathe. So really I only need power feed on this for doing the cutting operations I need to do. I also have another option for smaller turning operations where I still have my cross slide. So the cross slide still works perfectly fine. And the compound works perfectly fine. So if I want to do very small turning operations like I was doing with this, um, collet chuck here the other day I was doing some small 30 mil bar uh, uh, small turning operations I can use the compound to feed the cutter uh, transversely and I can use the cross slide obviously to feed the cutter across now obviously I don't have power feed on the cross slide again because uh, the drive for the power feed would have been down here at the bottom and it's gone now unfortunately but I do have a plan that over the next couple of years that I will make change gears myself to work the power feed again, which will bring this back to be able to cut treads. And I am going to look out for an apron to come for this. So if anybody knows where there's an apron for a 1930 Colchester Master, then please let me know. I'd be delighted to find an apron for this or even change gears I'd be delighted to or a clutch pack for it. But I've done a lot of looking and I've asked a lot of people and it hasn't, it hasn't come yet. So this is what we fabric cobbled together for the moment just to be able to get this machine to work and to be functional for us. Uh, but uh, yeah, there's still a lot more work to do. All right, let's get set up so and, um, and, and start fitting this uh, drum. Let's get this drum in here. Now machining drums, there's a few critical things that we need to machine drums. And one is you must know how the drum is set up. So this is the drum off of the Land Rover. And how this drum is centered on the Land Rover is through this diameter here. This diameter is what centers the drum on the um, uh, hub, front wheel bearing setup. If this was a mini, it would not be centered on this dimension. It actually is centered on the studs because a mini is stud centric as opposed to the Land Rover, which is hub centric. So the wheels of the Land Rover are centralized on the hub. The drum is centralized on the hub and the studs are only there to pull the wheel and drum together. On a Mini, that's not the way it is. On a Mini, it's got stud-centric everything. The drum is stud-centric, as is the wheels. Now, there is a, a hub on the Mini, which also acts as a centering situation to help the studs, which I'll show you is, um, when we have to do, we have a job to do in a couple of weeks time uh, on the on my race car on the red Tom Pitcher race car the red Tom Pitcher GT There is a job to do on its drums because they are slightly oval and I'm going to show you a slightly different machining operation on that But the Land Rover one is probably the most straightforward machining operation Now I know these drums are out of true and I know there's ridges all across them So I want to bring them back into true How am I going to set this drum up in the lathe? Well at the moment the collet chuck is in there and that's going to be no good because there's no way of mounting that drum onto the collet chuck. So what we need is we need the big independent four jaw chuck. So this is the four jaw chuck belonging to this lathe. I restored this a few years ago. Well, I restored it the year I got it. So that is two years ago now, I suppose. Um, it needed some work uh, done to it. I freed up all the jaws. There was a piece smashed out here, which I built back up with silver solder and foiled and machined it back down in. 
So that little four jaw chuck is, well, I say little, it's massive four jaw chuck, but that little massive four jaw chuck is going to go on here. And that will allow us to be able to set up the drum. So I'm gonna get this uh, collet chuck out of here and then we'll put the four jaw in its place. So the way the four jaw is held in is actually on a, this is a four jaw collet chuck. And the way it's held in is there's a nut here at the back with a centralizer, centralizing bushing, and it's on the taper of the spindle up here. So it sits on that taper in there. So there's a taper inside there and taper in there. That's the most accurate chuck I have here. So if I'm turning a bushing or I'm turning something uh, that needs to be really very, very accurate, then I'll use that, that's a four jaw independent collet. So that's a really nice chuck to have. So I'll put that standing up in the back, out of the way. Stands there. And we'll do our squats and bring this baby into action. So I find if I get it up there first onto the uh, bed of the lathe, and then really important, you must make sure that this spindle is completely clean and there's no chips. If there's a chip in there, it'll completely set off all of the centralization of this. Now, it probably is less important on a four jaw than it would be on, let's say, for example, a three jaw self-centering chuck, but it's still good practice to make sure you clean that off and have it nice and clean. So get this up onto here. That's where you need your muscles. The ones I don't have. <laughs> it's a good idea to have the lathe in gear when you're putting on this chuck uh, to tread it on there. Spin the chuck up. And then what I normally like to do is I like to just slam it once or twice and then give it a blow in gear with the copper hammer and that's the chuck on. All right, so that's the four jaw independent in place. Next thing to do is to get the chuck set up for uh, the drum. So where do you start with a four jaw chuck? There's brilliant videos out there, by the way, uh, on YouTube for machining. I'm, I'm but an amateur machinist. There's great people like Adam Booth over at ABOM69, I think it is. Uh, Adam has great videos on machining. Uh, people know here that I like watching Keith Fenner as well uh, on, what's oh, Keith, Keith's channel? Um, oh, I can't think right now. We'll put a link to it anyway. Um, so what I'm doing here is I've just checked that inside dimension there to see what diameter it is. And I'm checking off these rings here on the chuck. See these different rings on the chuck. You can use these as a guide to get the chuck into the basic right size. So I'm checking here to see are any of those rings close. Unfortunately, it's not the case. Uh, it's in the middle of two rings, but we can, we can get close. So if we bring in that jaw there until it's roughly in the same spot, out there somewhere. Okay, so get the drum up into the chuck. And I'm pretty close there already. I can feel, there we go. Now, first thing to do is to make sure you have the drum hard up against the, jo the jaws. Then you can just nip the jaws Put a tiny bit of tension on them. We don't want loads, just enough to hold the drum in place so that it's in the lathe. Next thing to do is just with your copper face hammer, just make sure that's hard up against the jaws. Which it is. And then we want to dial this in. So the way I do this, there's a hundred different ways to do this, right? But the way I like to do it is I like to get close with a visual reference 
And then I like to bring the dial indicator in and dial it in to the very last amount. So the right way to do that is to, we'll bring this cross slide down towards the uh, drum. Okay, we brought that over pretty close. We'll come another small bit. Um, we'll just lock that up there. Now, what I'm doing is I'm gonna bring over this cutter. Uh, well, it's the back of the, the cutter here. And I want to just, I have it rubbing the drum in a spot, okay? So, what we basically want to end up happening here is we want it that the, that, that that cutter runs through with the drum. So it should rub the whole way around or very close to rubbing the whole way around. At the moment, it's just hitting it in one spot. So it's hitting it in this spot here, okay? So each one of these jaws adjusts and they adjust independent to each other. If I want that drum to go that way, then I have to loosen that jaw and tighten that jaw. And then that will move the drum across the bed of the lathe. So at the moment we know that we're touching, where are we touching? Okay, we're touching just here, which is the middle of those two jaws. It's the center of those two jaws. So to get ourselves rough, what we want to do is slightly loosen those two jaws and slightly tighten those other two jaws. So loosen and tighten, you can kind of get yourself into a bit of a pickle here um, if you don't remember. So. For this lathe, to loosen the jaw, it's clockwise, and to tighten the jaw, it's counterclockwise. So what we do is we'll just loosen it off just a shade. We'll loosen this one off just a shade. And you have to be careful, you don't want to loosen it off completely because the drum will fall out of the machine. We want to tighten that one a shade and tighten that jaw a shade. Now we check and see, has the drum moved away? And now it's not touching that cutter anymore. So we'll bring it in until it touches again. Okay, there it is touching again. So where is it touching? It's touching in the same spot between those two jaws. It goes away there and it goes away there. So same thing again, clockwise for loosen. And I'm just loosening about the same both sides. And anti-clock to tighten. You always hear about anti-clock. You never hear about uncle clock. I wonder where he does be. All right. Enough of my jokes for today. All right, where are we touching now? So again, same thing. So, clock to loosen. Clock to loosen. And anti-clock to tight. All right, and we're bringing it in now. So now we're starting to get a bit more truity in there because it's hitting in a couple of places, but it's still over this side of the drum. So we'll go another small bit, clock, and we'll tighten up. Anti-clock. A little bit of clock there, small bit there, bit of anti there, small bit of anti this side. Let's see where we are now. So we are moving away. So we're getting tighter now. The whole time we're getting tighter, which means we're getting in closer and closer. And we're gonna to get to the stage now where we're gonna move on to the dial gauge. When do I know to move on the dial gauge? When I start hitting the drum in a couple of spots around here. Now this surface here is not going to be very true, but it gets us close, yeah? Gets us to the stage where we're close. So now we can move over to the dial gauge. And we can put the dial gauge anywhere we want. I like to put the dial gauge this side 
because then I can work off the same side I'm gonna work off of on the chuck. If I put the dial gauge another, I could put the dial gauge over this side, over here, but then I have to work opposite to the way I want. So for me, I find the easiest way to do it is to put it on the same side I'm working on. So get our little knockoff Nolga Mini holder here. And our dial gauge. There's a dial, digital dial gauge, but you don't have to use a digital dial gauge. You can use any dial gauge at all. It's just the one I'm using. It's just the one that's in the dial gauge holder at the moment. I'm gonna turn it out that way so maybe you guys can see it a bit easier. I have the indicator set up here now, and I'm gonna just show you the highs and lows of the inside of this drum. So if I turn this, you'll see the numbers changing, okay? So there's our high coming up. We're coming up to our biggest number, 60, and then we're dropping off again. So our high there is, at that point there, 60 something, okay? So what we know there is, is that the drum is moving away off center 0.6 of a millimeter. And when we come back around here, we'll eventually get to a zero and maybe just like, yeah. So our zero is there, okay? So what we want to now do is we want to adjust it. Because what we want to happen is, is that when we turn this chuck, we want to see the zero all the way around or very close to zero all the way around. Now we won't because there's ovulation in this drum, but I want to get a balance across the drum as close as I can. So uh, what we'll do now is we'll adjust our high so our high in this case is six. Uh, and I just want you to see um, that if I draw a line across where that high is pointing to, it's there and it comes across to that jaw of the chuck there. So that's our high, okay? And what that means is, is that we want basically to happen is we want the drum to go that way, right? So we want to loosen our highs and tighten our lows. So loosen our, low, our high is to go clockwise a small bit and tighten our low is to go anti-clockwise. Now let's go back to our indicator and see what happened when we did that. So as we rotate our drum around, we have our zero there, we're climbing up again so we've moved it now very little. So we need to go a bit more. We need to be a bit slightly more ambitious. So looking for our biggest number, which is there. Now we're starting to see the ovulation of the drum coming in. So we have our highest number there, which is 40 now, it was 60. Now if we go directly opposite that, we have our zero, so or close enough to our zero, so that's fine, that's one way. But now if we go to the middle here, sorry, go to the middle here, we have 50 there, and if we go to the opposite of that, we have, uh, 0.4 there, 0.5 there. So what we have is we have got it, it's out in two planes now. So let's keep going with this one. Get that one down, what's that? Uh, that's 0.3, so we'll go another bit there. So tighten that one again another small bit. And loosen off the other one a tiny bit. So where are we there now? Okay, now we're down to point there and where are we when we go the opposite of that there. all right we're getting there. We'll keep going at this. Come back to us in a minute and we'll have this running through. 
Okay, we've been just mucking around with it here now and we have it within 0.5 pretty much. There's a little bit of rust there that's just picking up, but we're getting minus one to 0.5. So I'm really happy with that. That's as true as that's going to get. Uh, so now what we'll do is we'll set up a cutter and we'll do one pass and see how the drum is for square in this way to see what way it is when we run across it. So I'll set the cutter up and then I'll get you ready for a pass. So we're going to touch off the cutter now until it touches the disc and starts to cut and then I'm going to back it out. I'm going to dial in the depth of cut and then we'll do a pass across the drum and see how it looks. I'm going to do this all uh, silently my end because the noise of the lathe you won't be able to hear me so uh, I'll fire up the lathe now and we'll touch off. I'm going to dial in the depth of cut here at ten thousandths and we'll take a pass. Okay, that's our first pass and it looks like the drum has pretty much cleaned up. There's a bit of chatter. Uh, not much though, I must say, not much. Uh, we might try one more very light pass, but pretty much I'm really happy with that. That cleaned up on the first cut, which is amazing, considering these drums probably have, oh, they could have 30 years, 20 years of service on them. Uh, so that's amazing that they cleaned up so easily there in the first pass. That was just 10 thousandths, that's all I took off there. So I think maybe um, we'll just do one face cut on that surface there just to bring back the rust that's there. And I'd be inclined to leave that. The surface finish is actually nice. You want some roughness to the surface finish for the pads to break back down again. People often leave the surface of brake drums really, really slick and shiny and you actually want a small amount of coarseness to the surface to take off that initial layer off the, off the shoe and bed the drum and shoe together. So I think a little pass across the front here and then um, that's one drum done, three to go. So I'm gonna just do a couple of face cut passes here. I'm just telling you about it before I turn on the lathe because obviously the noise. So I'll fire up the lathe now and we'll take these couple of cuts. We're getting a little bit of chatter there on that cutter. I don't think the uh, high speed steel really likes the uh, old cast iron. We might just change over to a carbide cutter, I think. Okay, I've changed out to the TCM carbide cutter. I know this will cut it, so we'll just do a pass with this and then I think we're there. Right, we knew that TCM had cut it anyway. That's absolutely perfect now. Very happy with that. Okay guys, I hope you enjoyed joining me here in the uh, machine shop with the Colchester. As you can see, 90% of machining is like if you're going to paint something. It's all about setup. It's about getting the drum through. It's about getting all your cutters in the right place, getting your feeds and speeds right, and then the cutting operation itself is painless. It's, you follow this real time as we cut that drum. Uh, not, not sped up, not uh, time lapse, just literally cutting that drum. It took one pass at 10 thousandths and then we had to uh, mess around a little bit. I tried a bit of high speed steel on that outside, but the cast iron is so rusty and hard, it's just knocking the tip off the high speed steel. So I went back to the TCM insert and it worked perfectly. 
To everybody who is new to the channel, you are most welcome. This is a channel where we do lots of different uh, projects between minis. We're working on our classic Land Rover. We do machining, we do fabric hobbling, uh, and we make things work here in our home shop. So if you're new, check some of the videos out. If you like what you see, maybe hit that subscribe button. For everyone who is a returning viewer, Thank you very much for your support and coming to watch videos again as usual here on our channel. Don't forget to bang that like button. It really does help for other people to get to see the videos and for YouTube to show more people our content. Other than that, I hope you enjoyed the video and I'll see you guys here in the next one.